Um, all right. So what are we talking about today? So um, Kubernetes security, one of the things um, over the past many years, I've worked across many organizations, you know, building Kubernetes or uh, creating Kubernetes architectures and deployment. Um, one of the things I have learned is security is an interesting uh, subject. Um, and there are reasons why we will go into it. But what we will go through today is kind of building a layered approach. Um, I will walk you folks through certain objects that you can layer on top of each other and create that protective kind of a shell for your Kubernetes clusters or your application. Now, some of the application layers, some of the, sorry, security layers are not, you know, you don't have to install fancy product for it. Um, they are native Kubernetes objects. Some of them are open source objects, and then you can get um, fancy on the outer layers as well, but depends um, how you want to approach it. So we'll look at some of these layers today, and I'll try to make sure that I'll give you some um, real world perspective on it. Um, cool. It will help if this thing moves. All right. So who are we? Uh, so as you would have seen in Simon's slide, uh, we uh, I work for a, a company called Enabler. Uh, we are a cloud engineering consultancy based out of Melbourne. Um, CNCF partners and Kubernetes certified product uh, providers. Now, they, these are not light words. It does mean something that we have seen enough Kubernetes. We have developed our own, you know, let's say battle tested blueprints of how Kubernetes can look like. And one thing, I'll, 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 I mean, with the Kubernetes ecosystem, it evolved. It is evolving at a rapid speed. There is new innovation every, let's say, hour. So one of the things we have done is with these blueprints is, you know, making sure that we're looking at the newer side of things and still, um, you know, building a secure platform for teams. Um, hit us up if you want to know more about it. So without wasting any much more time, why are we here? What are, why are we talking about Kubernetes security? One of the, I love Kubernetes. Like it is literally, I'll, I've been, involved with the meter group for past many years and i've talked about kubernetes a lot but one of the things with kubernetes is it is not secure by default so if you fire up a vanilla you know plain gen kubernetes cluster today um it won't be secure uh, out of the box what does that mean like it wouldn't the communication within the cluster is not it's it's open and it's unencrypted there's no like tls or whatever the default rbac that comes out of the box which more often than not, you will see, you will look at, you know, installation guides online for certain products and they will see, ah, oh, just because you're trying it out, assign, you know, attached to the cluster admin role. That is, I mean, that advice works for trying out a product, but it kind of people just use, start using those default roles. And unfortunately, they're very, they're over permissive and can lead to certain, uh, you know, exposures for your organization. Um, and also, you know, privilege escalation on your uh, containers or clusters can lead to um, compromise. Now, you might think of Kubernetes is so insecure, but who is attacking us or why are we even thinking about its security and everything? Because there are there are factors, right? Like, believe it or not, in larger enterprises or any organization, there are malicious actors, be it external or internal, trying to, you know, siphon off information, siphon off your products or... Um, get access to uh, data which they should not and then you know ransom you for money or whatever and sometimes um, this middle one sometimes it's it's accidental um, people without any bad intention because of a misconfiguration can expose your uh, your you know uh, platform or your kubernetes to external threats um, so combining these two together it kind of it puts it into a very a risky perspective or a risky posture. Um, so that's why we look at some of the objects today or some of the things that you can do as cluster administrators, engineers, security folks uh, to make this thing secure. Cool. So what are the things? Um, or maybe what is what are our objectives with this? Um, one thing I would mention, and I know it sounds like a cliche, but security is everyone's responsibility. I, I can't reiterate this enough. Um, I have seen organizations where uh, a platform team or a DevOps team or an infrastructure team waits for the security team to provide, you know, it's your responsibility, you secure things. We are just building infrastructure. With, with 
Kubernetes and the rate at which we are evolving or uh, progressing, I think it's everyone's responsibility. There are certain things with Kubernetes that Kubernetes administrators should be able to do, which will add towards your security posture. Yeah. Um, and there are things, obviously, uh, you need expertise. This doesn't mean that you don't need SEC expertise. You definitely need SEC expertise to come in and give you that, uh, you know, detailed, thorough uh, review or assessment, if you will, of your platform. Um, we will look at some of the Kubernetes native objects today, as I said, open source tooling. And this thing which is brewing up a lot in the ecosystem these days called supply chain security. I'll touch on it from a very high level perspective. Um, I'll have a chat with Steve if we can do another talk on supply chain security itself, but it is important part of it. Just think about it. You've secured your Kubernetes. You also need to secure the supply chain to it. So we'll talk about all of these things today. Um, all right, so Kubernetes native security. There are native objects, believe it or not, that you can, or native things that you can do today which will add to your security posture. The first one, very obvious one, is um, authentication and authorization. Um, I think this this has improved a lot over the last two years or whatever, um, but I still know of certain organizations or I've seen certain Kubernetes installation where uh, the legacy authorization modes are still available. People still use um, a generated key or a generated credential to access the cluster. Don't do that. Leverage an external auth uh, provider using OIDC. Any SAML integration, you can do any integration. You can integrate with your Azure AD if you have it, um, G Suite if you have it, um, maybe Octas or Auth Zeros or whatever, but think about external authentication mechanism. Kubernetes doesn't have a good um, authentication uh, mechanism natively. You have to trust on something else which provides Kubernetes the trust. Yes, they know you. Um, if you are, um, most people generally are, if you are running your workloads in cloud, leverage the cloud identity. Um, AWS has something called IRSA, which is IAM roles for service accounts, um, and GCP has workload identity. Do not use the old tooling that we used to use. Um, uh, Steve started a poll. That's okay. Um, do not do not leverage the. Other. I mean, even if you want to, like things like Cube Two IAM or KIM, they have gone into maintenance mode because KIM have was used to be the way we used to um, integrate with IAM on AWS, but they have gone into maintenance as well, saying you know what, IRSA is the best way to use identity. So my key takeaway from this slide for you folks is a leverage external authorization auth, um, be it whatever provider you use today, identity provider, and please, please, please use the cloud identity for workloads. Do not use um, keys or the old ways of sharing identity. So that was the first layer. Next one is RBAC. Now, I mean, generally people, ignore RBAC and don't look at the potential it has from a security perspective uh, because more often than not, the controls that you look at uh, in the CIS benchmarks or any NSA hardening guidelines, um, RBAC can play a very key role in this. And the first thing I would recommend, as I said earlier, was do not use the default roles. Just whenever you fire up a cluster, spin up a cluster, just ignore those roles. Do not use them. They are create your own standard, own roles, and base it on least privilege. Um, if you're creating roles for users, limit them to their namespaces. And I'm, I'm going to assume people are familiar with general Kubernetes you know, setup. But yeah, limit your users to your namespaces and grant them only just enough access that will allow them to go uh, about their day by day. Um, and build. so. More often than not, when you restrict up, so ideal case, I would say you don't need access to the cluster, right? If you're extracting all the logs and information away into your central system, you don't need access. But still, in certain cases, you would need to break glass and log into the cluster, or you might have some power users who want to try things which can't be tried in that lockdown mode. Have a procedure for it and um, log all of your API calls. That API log information can be very, very valuable when you do forensics on it. Okay, this user logged in, he did this, he did that. 
and you'll be able to uh, pinpoint what went wrong. Um, so again, key takeaway from this, do not use the legacy roles or default roles. Uh, always think about the least privileged um, roles or user access and have a break glass procedure and tighten your R back as much as you can. Like don't let people exec onto the pods in production at least. Uh, but yes, be aware there will be power users who would want to do things and let them do it in certain environments and restrict uh, and allow for break glass in others. So, quick question, Pati. Yeah, go for it, sir. It's all, it's all about you know mi minimum privilege at the end mm -hmm. of the day. That's what you know security you know security best practice. But how how can we tell mm. what the minimum controls are that are required to be able to achieve a certain goal? Are there any sort of cheat sheets on that one? Um, there are certain um, tools which I'll probably share it with the folks. Uh, um, whenever I share the links or whatever, there are certain tools actually uh, from an RBAC perspective, which can run analysis on your service account or run analysis on your pod as to what permissions it needs. But by and large, when you're deploying an application, you might just have to work it out. Okay, I need permission to, let's say, an S3. I need permission to, let's say, read a config map. I need permission to, let's say, mount a volume. So you don't have to give that role, that service account, exec permissions. You don't have to give that uh, that role or service account permissions to, you know, create new pods or deployments. So it's as easy as you know, just looking at what your application is trying to do or what that service account is trying to do, and then a running that restriction from that perspective. Um, and for let's say cloud provider accounts, there are certain analyzers like in Google. Google has an IEM analyzer. Um, AWS also has something similar. I don't remember what it's called, but you can run those analyzers as well. And lastly, there are certain tools which I don't remember the name. I will flick uh, the links to those um, somewhere because there's a list I, I, I generally refer to and they can analyze the permissions for you. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, Next one, uh, this is one of my most favorite objects in Kubernetes, namespaces. I don't know, they, they're the most underutilized objects. Nobody really, uh, people just think of namespaces. Hey, I can create a, you know, a uh, an environment using a namespace or whatever, but you can really do a lot of restriction on isolation using namespaces. Um, and one of the things, and this is a newer development, and again, when I say newer, it's like a year, year and a half old development. Um, these days you can key, create finer grain namespaces. So think of it as, let's say in your organization, there's a team, that team needs, let's say five namespaces, or maybe they need more than 10 namespaces. But for you as a engineer, it might be cumbersome to manage all 10. What you can do is create a parent namespace for them. And then under that, you can create the hierarchy and give them the permission to create any number of namespaces. And also you can apply hierarchical, uh, let's say policies across those namespaces. Um, there is a, the link is on the uh, slide. There is a controller from Kubernetes 6 called hierarchical namespaces controller. That is what it exactly lets you do. Um, the other thing I would also recommend for folks is from, again, think about resource quotas. People generally think about resource quotas and they uh, and one thing that will spring to your mind is, oh, it is about resources. It's about scaling. It's about HPAs. But you can be clever and use them for your security as well. Um, an example for this is you can literally say that in my entire cluster, um, except for one namespace or whatever, but in my cluster, there should be no services of type load balancer. And then in the ingress namespace, just allow one. So you know that the only ingress point or any load balancer type service in your entirety of cluster is located in that namespace. That could be one example. Another example could be in your cube public or your cube default namespaces, you can just say there should be no pods or containers running in these um, and just set the count of the object to zero. And that's just a resource quota. And maybe in the default namespace, you can say there should be only be one service, which is the Kubernetes service. Unfortunately, you need it for communication between kubelets and masters. Um, so again, my takeaway for you folks from this is leverage namespace as one of the layers for uh, increasing your security uh, controls or tightening your security controls. Um, think of objects like resource quotas. There's not just for resource control, but they can also you know, help you 
uh, with some security measures. And lastly, start thinking about finer grain namespaces. Don't just create big namespaces with 15 applications in it or more than 15 applications. Uh, back in the day, we used to like that was the there was no hierarchical namespaces. Uh, but now you can go finer grain with finer grain permissions on those namespaces. So that's my key takeaway here. How am I doing for time? Can I, can I ask a quick question, uh, Pratik? Yeah, go for it. Um, what, what are your thoughts on uh, pinning namespaces to uh, nodes or node pools? Is, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? <laughs> Uh, he's going there. Anyway, so it's a it's a common approach that I have seen uh, from an isolation perspective or restriction perspective. Um, it it is a pseudo control, is what I would say, and I'm trying to be a bit careful with my words here. Um, it doesn't offer you exact benefits. I mean, you can lock a namespace to a node pool. Um, reasons could be, you know, you want a specific characteristics in scaling, maybe you're running an ML workload, you're running a GPU node pool, and you want to do it that way. But from a security perspective, there has to be a lot more layered on for that to be effective. On its own, it won't be that effective, is what I would say. I know that's a very, uh, <laughs> not answer, but answer kind of way of saying it. But yeah, it's not on its own, it's not a very effective control. You will want to layer it with other controls. I'm hoping that answered Simon's question. Um, <laughs> next object. So we've covered three or four objects, three objects by now. Next object, and again, this is a key one which people generally ignore, is network policies. Um, I would say you can, you don't necessarily have to create like a like your own island and you know build your fortress there, but still start by default deny across your entire cluster and then just be permissive. Uh, based on no namespaces or based on pod, you can go very fine grain that you know only two pods will are allowed to talk to each other in certain namespaces, or there is a very direct ingress or egress flow out of or into your cluster using network policies. Um, but leverage those deny like just start with the default deny all. Just don't. I mean, I saw a meme today which was yeah I've got network policies, but the default policies allow all. That doesn't. That really doesn't help anyone. If you want to go network policies, start by dropping all traffic and then go selectively allow. Now, one of the critical things with network policy is testing. Um, it's very hard to. So, if you created two namespaces and you want to deny traffic amongst them, it's very hard to test. I would recommend folks to check out this tool by Control Plane IO called NetAssert. What it does is it looks at your network policies and then tries to simulate, let's say, pods, um, which will adhere to that network policy or try to test that network policy. It automates uh, the, the most curly part of network policy testing. Um, what else? So yeah, my, my, oh yeah, one thing I would make a note with network policies, if you've got a plain Jane Kubernetes cluster, you would need a controller that can support network policy enforcement. Uh, so something like a Calico or a Cilium would, would be required. Without those, you can't. So if you just got flannel on your cluster, the policies won't be enforced. You will be creating them, but they won't be enforced. There was nothing to enforce them. Um, so yeah, start using network policies and look at that NetAssert tool. It will save your lives. Just another quick question, Pratik. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Getting way too many questions here. So Sunil asked a question about how to, uh, this is with regards to compliance mm -hmm. controls. So he's interested around how, how you actually um, implement uh, compliance controls around uh, cube cluster security. Mm -hmm. So if you can just maybe extend yeah. that a little bit. How, how do you implement, yeah. how do you test, and how do you observe? Yeah, no, that's that's an absolutely uh, good one. There is a slide on the open source tooling. Um, if you can wait till that point, I will answer it then. Or yep. yeah, we will cool. hold you to it, Samuel and I. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's let's tackle that question when we reach uh, that, that point. Um, so, network policy. Look at this object. Um, definitely try out that tool uh, and build your you know network enforcement using it. Um, oh, sorry, password controller. Um, next one, security context. Now, um, this is 
hey, I, I, I will admit this is a bit difficult when it comes to, you know, um, implementing controls. And generally, when you talk to developers saying, hey, in your pods, you need to add the security controls, it gets a bit hairy. Like people don't understand what the um, what they have to do. But by far, this is a strong, strong control mechanism. Um, it can, if you want to make an immutable pod, there's the flag for you right there. You can just say read only root file system is equals to true. Um, you also, uh, my advice would be whenever you run it, uh, drop all uh, privileges and only add the ones you need. So, for instance, if you're running an Istio service mesh, your Envoy doesn't need all all freaking uh, uh, what's it called capabilities, right? It doesn't need to go and call kernel and do fancy shenanigans. But it will need network privileges. It will need network capabilities. So you can just drop all and then assign network net uh, capabilities to it. Now, one thing I would recommend if you are going to, in your organization, enforce, let's say, security context in all pods or on configuration, I would absolutely recommend integrating something like KubeSec into your pipelines. So what KubeSec does is, it's a, it's think of it as a static analysis tool. It's kind of like a sauna cube, but for Kubernetes manifest. So when you look at your manifest and when you throw a manifest at KubeSec, it will scan it and say, hey, you, you, you have a security context, but you've got run as user root or you've got privilege to true. Um, in fact, it can also scan other resources and look for dodgy configuration. Um, so definitely integrate KubeSec into, regardless if you want to enforce security context or not, which I would recommend, yes, you should. Uh, you should integrate KubeSec into your pipelines and provide the feedback as fast as you can to your teams. Um, now there is, I will admit, I think it's the next slide, uh, but I will admit there's new uh, thing. So as Simon said, port security policies has been deprecated, but the new thing is called port security standards. And there is a bit of a conversation happening as to should you use security context or should you use port security standards? Um, I think you can, there's a place for both. They're not kind of one replaces the other. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, next one. Now, this is kind of getting into the advanced layers, but still native object, but advanced layers. Folks, generally, I haven't seen any organization do this um uh, properly or at scale uh, but my recommendation is always think about app armor and seccomp there are default profiles available with your docker engine on your clusters um, enforce those profiles onto your uh, pods or containers and what app armor lets you do is uh, restri it restricts what your container can do from a capability perspective like do you want to give it files capability? Do you want to give it network capability or no capability at all? Like for instance, you can see the first thing here is an app armor prof policy. Now I will admit that they, this looks very challenging and this is where you need security specialists to come in and write down these policies or help you with the policies if you're a cluster administrator or there is a lot of inspiration available in the open source. Um, Secomp is also, um, and interesting one. Now, these two protect your pods or containers from the container escape vulnerability. So if somebody breaks out of the process and if you've got a parm or a seccomp, you could be rest assured there is a layer that will prevent uh, the cluster breakout. Uh, seccomp kind of restricts uh, what, you know, what uh, kernel calls you can make. Again, these are some advanced level concepts, but uh, definitely check them out. There is a default policy set available on the clusters. At least leverage them. Um, audit logging. I think this goes without saying that you should absolutely enable. And that policy on the right hand side, which is level metadata for everything, it will tell you who was the requesting user, what was the time sent, and what was the resource and where. Now, how would you use this? Is a question I get very commonly. Now, think of it is. Um, if somebody is trying to, let's say, deploy a pod in Kube public or whatever, right? And it is getting rejected because you've got some uh, resource quotas or whatever. That pod will never run, right? But you still, from a security standpoint or from a cluster administration standpoint, need to run forensics as to what was happening. What was the event log on my cluster? This is where this audit log can help. You can go back in your logging system and have a look. Okay. Why was this happening? It wasn't successful, but why wasn't this happening? 
Now, generally, and this is another question I get, like, wouldn't your monitoring and observability pick these up? It, they might, but they might not, because if your request resource quota is to not allow that pod, it will never run. So your observability may or may not pick it. But this metadata uh, from the audit logs will definitely have a log of it, and you should use it or collect it and run forensics on it. Um, oh, and the other thing is it, the audit logging also helps you in diagnosing or debugging when things are going pear-shaped. Um, so I think it was today or yeah, someone asked me a question about um, we are getting this message reply back from Kubernetes. Some label was not being created. Immediately I went, let's look at the API logs. Something is rejecting it. So it is not necessarily just a security thing, but it will help you diagnose and debug gnarly Kubernetes issues. Cool. I'll Sorry, speed up question. a little. Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question saying, does KubeSet look at active resources on the cluster? And the essence of this one, this person's been having a look at KubeBench as an audit mechanism. And if you've got any feelings about both of those, KubeSec versus KubeBench. Um, KubeSec actually doesn't. So KubeSec, what it will do is, it's kind of like a sauna cube. You do it in your CI, CD, um, uh, uh, pipeline. You can in uh, you can scan your probe manifest there. Uh, KubeBench again will not necessarily. I mean, KubeBench will run like a CS CIS scan against your cluster. I think the more uh, uh, intuitive one or a good one these days is Cube Escape from ArmorSec. I think. Um, and what you can do with Cube Escape is when you run it against a cluster, specify a framework that you want to execute. You can say I want to execute NSA. Uh, hardening guide or I want to execute against CIA framework and that will give you a lot better picture. KubeBench is still use, I mean, very, very um, uh, good tool. So use it, but I would say give Cube Escape a try as well. Um, but to your question, yeah, KubeSec is only for manifest or at least it was for manifest until unless they've changed things. Cool, thank you. Cool, cool. All right, let's this to some of these ones. So pod security standards, as I said, it's an admission controller. This has been developed by the Kubernetes SIGs um, and uh, has a webhook or an admission controller available. It is, it was, uh, it is in beta as of 1.23, so pretty new, uh, and kind of replaces the PSP. Um, it has, uh, so on your namespaces, you can say, um, um, you can provide like a label saying, uh, security mode is enforced or audit or warn, and that is what this admission controller will do. And you can also create exemption policies, which was very difficult back in the day with PSPs. Um, so overall, the SIGs have um, built a very good tool. There's an open uh, CAP, which is Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal. Actually, it's not open, but it's a Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal for Pod Security Admission Controller by Tim Allclair. I would absolutely recommend folks to go and read it. Even halfway through, it wouldn't make much sense, but I would say go read it. It has got some design documents. Go read them as well. It will give you a lot more um, in-depth understanding of how, what they're trying to do, why this is important, why you should use it. Um, I should have had a link here, but I'll paste it in the meetup chat somewhere. Um, OK, cool. Let's be through. Um, so, okay, we looked at a whole heap of objects. If you layer all of these objects, you've already got a, like a solid defense going on uh, uh, for your cluster. And some general recommendations is, I've seen this in practice, and I'm, I'm, I kid you not, the reason I mentioned the first one is private clusters or control planes. Please create private clusters if you don't necessarily have to make them public. Like there might be use cases you are building an edge cluster or something. It might need to be public, but just because you're, CI, CD needs to access it is not a reason good enough to make a public cluster or just because you don't want to VPN it does, is not a good enough reason to create public cluster. Um, think of private clusters unless um, it is useful. Now, there might be situations where, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't work for an enterprise and you don't have like VPNs or crazy shenanigans. Maybe then restrict it to the known IP addresses at least. Uh, but the key point is make them private, be it either via network or restricting the security groups or whatever. Um, leverage admission controllers. There are a whole heap of ad admission controllers. As we saw, port security standards is one. There are public ones available. 
uh, in the open source community, which can be either validating or enforcing. Um, so when your object is being applied or when a request is made to Kubernetes, these controllers step in between, run through your checks and pass it or, uh, you know, deny it. They are very good. You can write your own as well. Like it could be a random admis admission controller that you might want to build implementing your organization's control. But have a think about those. Um, externalize all telemetry. Now, this might sound like, oh, it's not a security control. But the reason I recommend this is <laughs> there are only few reasons why a engineer on day-to-day -day basis would want to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. And more often than not, it's looking at telemetry, looking at kubectl logs, or looking at KTOP, or looking at, you know, how my HPA is scaling, or Grafana's, or whatever, or whatever. If you externalize all of this telemetry, you've already taken out their need to, you know, access the cluster, which means you can then tighten down your RBAC and deny any, you know, exec privileges, or looking at logs privileges, or whatever. Um, and the more you externalize, the more these clusters could be, you know, uh, tightly restricted from an access perspective. So that's why I do recommend externalizing your telemetry and don't run Kubernetes dashboard if you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, please don't. Um, and if you do, secure it with your life because that is one of the most vulnerable things I have seen. And again, I'm being very harsh about it, but yeah, don't run if you don't have to. With the cloud provided or cloud managed Kubernetes, generally you don't need one. Um, GK has got good dashboards, uh, EKS, meh, um, semi good dashboards, but you can run tools like Octent from VMware Tanzu. Um, they are kind of dashboards running from your local machines. So obviously, you would need, like the cluster administrators would need authentication. Um, but yeah, avoid dashboard if you can. And lastly, Look at secure runtimes like GVisor. This is an open source project from Google, which kinds of run runs a a uh, what's it called a shell between your kernel and your pod, a proxy shell. Sorry, uh, proxy kernel. Sorry, through between the actual kernel and your pod. So any kernel request goes through uh, GVisor. Cool. So we looked at a lot of Kubernetes native objects. So so far we built this layer up. Um, and we've already got enough padding around our Kubernetes. Now look at let's look at few, I think, couple of open source projects, which I think are very interesting and folks should absolutely consider. Um, Gatekeeper OPA. Now, the question, let me remember the question. How do you enforce Kubernetes security in Kubernetes clusters, if I'm not mistaken? Oh, actually, I can go to the question stuff. Um, how to implement... <laughs> implement control, test controls and then observe that nobody's yeah. doing no configuration drift. Yeah, so um, configuration drift and compliance, so the two aspects, we'll have a look at them uh, individually. So from implementing controls perspective, right, like this thing, which is Gatekeeper OPA. So just for folks who haven't heard of OPA Gatekeeper, OPA is an open policy agent. You can write uh, policies in regular. Um, and then uh, load it in OPA, and then you can query OPA saying, hey, OPA, I've got this object, does it comply with the policy? And OPA can tell you yay or nay. But it's a generic open source policy engine. Um, Gatekeeper is a Kubernetes-specific admission controller built on top of OPA. So when you deploy Gatekeeper OPA onto your Kubernetes cluster, there's an actual admission controller. And when, let's say, you're doing kubectl apply, deploy your pod, um, Kubernetes API is actually going to call Gatekeeper and ask Gatekeeper, hey, I've got this request to apply this pod definition. Does it match all my policies? Depending on what policies you have, it will either allow or deny your admission. Now, having said that, now think about the implication of running this admission controller, which you can write your own policies. You can enforce you can load up entire kubernetes compliance baseline into this opa engine and what i mean by that and there's 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 a whole heap of open source policy available there's a if you go to github um, for opa gatekeeper there is actually an open source gatekeeper library which has all these controls written as OPA uh, Rego already. So you can load up all of those as compliance controls into OPA. Now, the point about observability, 
So if you run, let's say, Gatekeeper OPI, you can operate it in uh, audit mode. So what will happen is whenever a request comes in, any request, any kubectl request, right? Any API request, let alone kubectl, any API request that hits your Kubernetes control plane will go through this. And if it finds violation, so let's just imagine, let's take an example. You've defined an OPA policy saying um, there can be no images which are referenced from Pratik's uh, registry, right? It's a registry, let's just imagine. And if any pod definition has the image referencing Pratik's registry, you want to deny it or you want to stop it. Once you've defined this policy, load it into your gatekeeper OPA, any request, any further request, further request um, that comes into your cluster, it will be checked against this policy. And if even one of those says, oh, Pratik's dodgy registry, that will be either rejected if you're in enforcement mode or logged and audited, If oh, sorry, logged if you're in audit mode. So that's how you can create the visibility. Um, and I believe there are certain metrics also available for Gatekeeper, you can tap into that. So that's part one, how you can do compliance controls, make them visible to a degree where you can go, you know what, uh, I am not getting, getting any rejections or violations in my Gatekeeper OPA. You can calculate a threshold and surface up to your CISOs or CIOs, whoever, like this is our compliance threshold. The other thing was drift detection, I think is what you said, Steve. Um, there is a couple of ways of solving drift detection as well. In, in Kubernetes these days, there's a very popular thing going on or in the ecosystem, uh, which is GitOps. Um, now you don't have to use GitOps. Generally, the way you want to uh, push configuration is you know checking configuration in some central repository and deploying to via some CI CD pipeline. But what GitOps let you do is it runs a controller on the cluster and let's say if you've checked in your security policy into GitOps and somebody comes on the cluster manually, pokey, 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 and modifies it, GitOps controller will see that as a drift and it will reconcile it back to its previous state. And I think it also has a metric as to how many drifts it has detected or whatever. But that's just very generically speaking. Hope that answers that question. I think it's kept, it certainly kept me happy and I trust Sunil as well. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, so the key takeaway from this slide, think of Gatekeeper OPA, think of it as a central guardrails as policy for your organization or your cluster. Now, people do get put off by regular. So there are certain alternatives. Kiverno is a YAML native. If there are fancy YAML stitches in the cloud and you want to write YAML only, you can look at Kiverno. And there's a new one called Cube Warden. Uh, which is also very intuitive. So if you don't want to write Rego, you can have a look at these two. But some sort of admission controller that helps you define policies, which can be enforced at the cluster level, is highly recommended. Cool. Let's whisk through this. Um, next one. This is, again, one of my favorite ones, uh, KH threat detection. Now, there are many, many ways of doing this, right? Um, and the tool that I mentioned at top, Sysdig Falco, it's an open source uh, tool available or uh, so Sysdig donated the tool to CNCF and it's 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 one of the really <clears throat> modern threat detection engines. So what it does is it is based on eBPF um, and what it does is it taps into all your kernel level syscalls or kernel level calls and tries to detect if there is something which should not be happening is happening and then it can stream it off either into your logs, your syslog logs or to an external um, engine and if you look at this screen there's a there's a there's a kind of policy that I'm trying to um, sh show here is if let's say um, there is a program that is trying to change its namespace this is Linux namespace not Kubernetes namespace if it is trying to change its namespace like let's say if I'm running in network namespace NS1 and I'm I'm trying to switch from NS1 to NS2 this thing will detect like how is that program doing on itself there should be some orchestration that does it for it and what that will do it will produce an output like this a name change namespace change event was uh, detected by an unexpected program now as a security person as a secops person these are gold this is like a log line if you see it on your screen you probably want to run towards your cluster with something to smash with um and it can help you. Like 
it without falco or any of these tools which can tap into that lower layer of kernel it is very hard to detect these events um and you can there's a whole heap of policy set on falco which i will absolutely recommend you folks to check it out and if you are you know somewhat serious about your security this is one of the layers you absolutely want around your cluster um and you can take this telemetry this output stream it into either your cspm system your cloud security posture management system or some sort of a logging engine maybe you have sumo you have elastic whatever and then just alert on it like imagine if you get an alert like you know this kind of event is happening you can be well ahead of a potentially malicious uh, you know exploit of your cluster so absolutely look at tools like sysdig falco um there are others um but i i am i would recommend this one um and also do go check out their policy set even if you're not implementing it tomorrow go check out their policy set i i'm definitely sure that will persuade you otherwise um next one again we talked about network security we talked about network policies uh, but that's in the kubernetes native world like a new network policy object um what i want to call out here is there are cnis which are doing above and beyond uh not just from a networking perspective but adding to the security posture as well and cilium is one such um network cni it's based on ebpf again so taps into the kernel level events the networking stack of the kernel and gets all the events from there and when you apply policies using cilium it applies at that layer and blocks traffic um and you can do um l3 l4 based policies or you can also do l7 based policies like an fqdn support in crd so a lot of words there in network policies today if you use calico you can't use fqdns like fully qualified domains you can't just say don't if there is traffic going to pratik.domain.com don't don't allow it uh with cilium you can actually do that just blacklist your domains from an egress perspective or from an ingress perspective um and just do it and there is a whole heap of innovation happening in cilium like one of the things i'm happily i'm very excited about is this proxy less traffic encryption so at the moment if you want to encrypt traffic within the kubernetes cluster you need to run some sort of a service mesh which would run proxies they are kind of looking at proxy less traffic encryption um and also they are working on something called a cilium service mesh which is already in its beta program um and that will simplify the service mesh ecosystem a lot but again a lot to look forward to you may not choose this cni but look for the benefits this provides and if any other cni can provide it so be it go cool. let's rush to uh, last one again service mesh again this i would say take it with a pinch of salt yeah i am my recommendation here is if you absolutely need it if if all the attributes you need from a security perspective can only be satisfied for service mesh then go for a service mesh because there is a very steep learning curve with service meshes and all credits to you folks like linkerd they have simplified it a lot they are a lot lot more performant and very good uh, service mesh offering but still it has a lot of steep learning curve and with especially with this guy istio i have seen a lot more misconfiguration bugs then i want to admit um so evaluate your use case don't just go oh service mesh i will have zero trust tomorrow let's just implement it that it's not that easy trust me it's very difficult to configure it so you would it actually be um you will won't be contributing to uh, strengthening your uh, security posture you would be actually weakening it so think of your requirements what do you want from a service mesh and then make a decision where you want to go but the benefits are there like right? you get mtls amongst all your pods uh you get authorization policies like chart validation header validation so yes there are validation but there is a steep learning curve to it cool we are to a uh, home stretch all right so i know in the beginning i talked about you know there were three kind of layers one was your uh, you know native objects we've already built those layers then some open source tooling you've already strengthened it now you want to secure the supply chain and there's a lot of open source movement around supply chain security at the moment so i'll go very high level um one thing you want to do today or you would want to do in your pipelines is uh, scan all your containers in ci get that fast feedback don't wait until it reaches your cluster 
run things like Aquasec TV, uh, which will, which again is eBPF based scanning of your containers and it will tell you vulnerability score and things like that. Um, as we discussed previously, scan your manifest in your CI with KubeSec. Uh, you don't have to wait till the very end before you deploy into cr uh, cluster. You can ascertain or block or provide that feedback way early in the cycle. Um, also, if you want to, uh, if you've already, so I've seen organizations where you use OPN Gatekeeper to build a whole policy set. You can use those policy set in your CI pipelines and well and scan them against your manifest and see if they meet uh, your policy standards, which will again give you faster feedback. Um, scan your registries constantly. Even if you, you know, pass through CI today and your images are living in the registry, I would still say scan your registry. Um, and there is support by cloud providers for these like ECR and GCR, I think, offer scanning. So use them, uh, look at those results because you might have deployed that image already and three days later, there's a CVE. You would not want to know about it. And again, this is a cliche point, but again, it, it, it is worth making that if you can adopt this philosophy that all changes that are made to your cluster are made via pipelines or GitOps, if that's your flavor, I think you will help contribute towards security. And don't, you don't need to be a security specialist to just achieve that, right? As a cluster administrator, you can build a means where people can easily deploy to your cluster or consume your cluster ex without having to kubectl access it. Um, and again, just in time privileged pipelines, like don't give your pipelines absolute God mode all the time. If you can, if you can run with just in time privileges for your pipelines, it will help you. Um, last one is, this is what I was talking about. Like, make sure what you're running on your clusters is what you have intended to. Now, there is uh, this whole thing called salsa.dev. The link is there on the on the slide. Uh, salsa is kind of like a supply chain levels of software artifacts is what it is called. But what they're trying to do is at each level of a software artifact journey, there could be... Um, there could be actors, malicious actors who can, you know, either break it or, you know, exploit it. And how do you prevent against those is what that outlines. I would absolutely recommend if you are somewhat interested in security, go check it out. It's it's a very good resource. Um, and the things, uh, places like uh, Google and AWS are already starting to implement some of the concepts. So GCP had a service long before Salsa was public. Uh, it's called binary authorization. So the intention is when you're going through your supply chain, you're going through each step, you attest your image saying, I have done this step, here's my attestation. And at the very end, when you're about to deploy into a cluster, all of those attestation get verified uh, by a very simple PKI exchange. But have a look at salsa.dev. Oh, and another thing is six store cosign. That is also a very um, upcoming project from a security standpoint for supply chain. So highly recommend it, check it out. So what's the summary from the supply chain security? Um, the summary is you have secured your Kubernetes cluster. Make sure you pay enough attention to your pipelines. Don't just allow God mode pipelines interacting with this your secure layer of Kubernetes. Uh, don't just allow anything randomly coming into your clusters. Know what you're running in your clusters. So, why did we start all of this discussion? Yeah. So the discussion was Kubernetes is open or not secure by default and people, the red bad people here trying to exploit our clusters. And what we've done, talking about each of those objects, we kind of built a layer. <laughs> I know this is oversimplification of what we just said, but anyway, we kind of tried to build layers and layers and layers of protection around Kubernetes. Um, you more often than not, you would, as engineers, we think, oh, I've got one thing to secure it. It should be okay. But as a security person, your mind should, mindset should be, how can I build that layered defense in depth? That if the first layer breaches, there's something else to protect. If the, that layer breaches, something else to protect. And building these layers, um, you will be able to add to the security posture. And as I said, like there are Kubernetes native objects, right? Like that will add to your security posture. So don't just run vanilla plain Jane clusters. I know nobody does, but 
think about those native objects very seriously then think about tools like falco or um sysdig or oh no sorry uh, gatekeeper opi yeah sysdig falco or gatekeeper opi to provide that extra layer um conclusion let's conclude all right so we started up this with this point right security is everyone's responsibility and i think in my slides what i have tried to do is call out all the objects that us lot as kubernetes admins can do and then just engage security for some specialist you know uh, requirements or uh, security controls so us lot as a uh, uh, cluster admins we should contribute to securing our clusters there's a lot of open source effort and a lot of open source security guidance these days um so yeah go and explore it there's a lot of tools um and as i said there's set of open source libraries for opi which you can just take and as is and deploy to your cluster i mean don't just do the classic copy a shell script from internet and run it on your cluster but have a read about <laughs> read through them and then run them in your cluster and again it's another cliche but just it's not just a tick box exercise yeah uh, make sure you are consuming the telemetry from these let's say opa gatekeepers or falco um and last one as i said there are commercial offering available as well like sysdig uh, does have a commercial offering there's a new kid on the block called lacework they have a commercial offering um the, you have a look at them if you want to further strengthen your security lastly we are hiring come join us and let's do this madness together cool are you really telling me that I shouldn't be like curling bash scripts and piping them off to <laughs> piping them off to bash it's fine that's mad talk yeah <laughs> that's what i do as a security engineer curl bash <laughs> um anyway are there any questions or have i talked way too much and people are just sleeping now yeah we've got uh we've got a got a couple little little cheeky cheeky but not pretentious questions <laughs> it's always a good balance so i got um a question around dropping in uh, opa gatekeeper if you've been running a cluster for let's say a year or something mm -hmm. is um gatekeeper going to do anything retrospectively or is it just going to look after policy no. checks from this point forward yeah unfortunately it's a admission controller so as the name suggests it it will work on admission um so if you've been uh running a you know a cluster for a year and you want to deploy i think there are ways to uh trigger the checks I'm, i can't remember right now but by and large the theory is it's an admission controller so you can only kind of inspect on admission um there will be some nifty tricks to trigger it for existing objects but you would have to bounce them or do something with him i don't think there will be an easy way or that's at least what i know i can have a look cool so normally when pratik has been good enough to give us uh so, you know to sh share some stories with us before it's really difficult to get the enabler word out of his mouth he just <laughs> he's so damn helpful but uh yeah, it's great. Obviously, you guys have got some real, some real smart people in there. So if anybody's looking for next gig, post up your LinkedIn profile in uh, chat. I think the the HR person may have left their left their profile up there. And uh, why not just have a chat? Even if you're not looking for next gig, just um, get in touch because it, it's all about your network. At the end of the day, you never know what's going to happen around the corner. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we live in a bit of a turbulent world these days. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You never know, you know, <laughs> what's happening at the next shop. So yeah, I would encourage for you folks to come check us out. Um, but anyway, as I said, as Steve said, mostly these I aim to provide as much information as as I can. What I've learned from community or what I've learned from my experience. If it was helpful, do let us know. If it wasn't, do let Steve know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we'll remain in all seriousness, that's excuse that's technical technical uh, talk there. Um, yeah, it's traditional thing. Just to show show some appreciation in chat there. If you if you got some value, then 
shout out about it in chat and please, please, please do um, answer our questionnaire, which will be fired out um, after this. If, as Pratik says, if we're awesome, let us know. If we're not, let us know. Just let us know what you want to hear more of. Okay, that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, in the meantime, absolutely. Yeah, Pratik. No, so I was just saying, yeah, if you have any questions, apologies, was there wasn't enough time. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot them through LinkedIn or Twitter or send it to, you know, our meetup chat, whatever. I'll see. I'll try to answer as to the best of my capabilities. But yeah, 